Okay, today's passage is Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 through 30. Let's read them together. Ready? Go. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for um, giving us this another day to worship you as a body of church. And thank you for keeping us safe in the past week Um, as we continue with our lives. Let us remember that you are the one who is in control of everything, everything we do, everything we think, and whatever uh, lays ahead of you, uh, us. So please be with us and please guide us through this Uh, turmoil and chaos that we're facing every day so we can be the winner of this battle because of you. Thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Okay, last week, the theme of last week was Paul's unshakable faith in Christ Jesus because he was going through a difficult time and he wasn't sure about the, the future near future, that is, what's going to happen after this um, trial, because he was in jail. and But he had this faith in Christ. Eventually, in eternity, he will be saved. That was his comfort. That was his hope. So he had this amazing faith that we uh, witnessed last week. For today's passage, the main theme is be worthy of, of the gospel of Christ. That's from verse 27, but it goes all the way through uh, the middle of chapter 2. And that's the main theme of this passage. Okay, verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent. So, We heard about this expression many, many times, but let's take a look at what it really means. Because literally speaking, you can say this way too, only behave as citizens worthy. Citizens worthy. So if you look at Acts chapter 16, which we visited a few weeks ago uh, as a background for the church in Philippi, they, Paul's uh, group, his uh, co-workers, they arrived at Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. So we knew it was part of Roman colony, meaning the city of Philippi had this Roman citizen type of privilege or benefit. So people living in there, in that city, had some kind of um, kind of pride. They're uh, they were proud of themselves about living in that city, because not like other areas in the, that M- empire, they had this special treatment as a citizen of Rome, because they were not real Roman citizens, but still they're considered considered as equal um, people in that sense in certain areas. So they were proud of that. And the problem, though, was this. Throughout the entire Roman Empire, people worshiping are worshiping their emperor. So Caesar was supposed to, they were supposed to call him, address him as a savior and lord. That was a problem for the Christians back then. Let's think about this. Philippians chapter 3 says, But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, 
the Lord Jesus Christ. So since they were calling Jesus as the only Savior and the Lord, they had some conflicts with the people in uh, Rome and Roman Empire. So the authority was saying, you had to call Caesar as your Savior and Lord. But the Christians in Philippi, for example, they said, no, we can't do that because our only Savior and the Lord is Jesus Christ. Back then, let's think about this, 2,000 years ago, almost everyone in the nation is calling someone Savior and the Lord. That was kind of the law that's reinforced throughout the nation. And it seems to be we are the only ones who are not doing that. Think about this, right? So, I mean, when we read this passage, it may not be, uh, uh, you know, sound like a good or huge issue, but this was a huge issue. I mean, we can think about some big issues today, but back then, that was a big one. So my question to you is, other than being a Christian, what privilege do you value the most? Some of you are working for the corporations and they hand out this um, ID card. So you have this privilege of going into different places. No one else can get into. Sometimes some people have a top secret clearance as a government employee. So they can handle some sensitive uh, documents, confidential documents, government documents, right? Not many people ac have access to the, that kind of documents. So those are good things to have. But do you cherish your privilege and um, God-given right as a Christian in this world? Have you ever thought about being a Christian as a privilege in your life? Let's continue. <clears throat> so in the middle part, let me, let me pick up from here. I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. It's not for some other reasons. Your partners in business, no. You are partners in the gospel. So when you do that, when you do that, naturally, you are going to have opponents. Not necessarily people trying to intentionally harm you all the time, but if you imagine what could have happened back in 2,000 years ago, they must be persecuted big time because they denied to acknowledge Caesar as their Savior and the Lord. So when you stick to the gospel message, you will naturally have some opponents. Let's take a look at opponents. Number one, all the forces against God. It can include ourselves, myself, right? So let's take a look at the Bible. It says in James chapter 4, verse 4, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. It's very uh, clear dichotomy right here. If you are friendly with the world, meaning if you follow what the world is chasing after, their entertainment, their objective lives, and their philosophy, their thoughts about this, this cultural development, and human societies and the way they look at the life of people, all those things, if you think about twice or three times, initially it makes sense, but if you compare that with biblical values, almost no exception, almost everything they say is against the Bible. <clears throat> we're not judging those people. We're not going to hate those people, but we're saying, when I compare A from B, A and B, there's a difference. That's all we're saying. It's different from what the Bible says. 
For example, when we say it's a human right to go through abortion, there's a situation that they must or they want to do this. But what the Bible says is our proper conclusion is we can't do that. That's the rule. And I mentioned this before, just because people getting divorced doesn't mean we can tweak the Bible saying, okay, it's okay to divorce. There's a situation. It has to happen, I would say. And people go through that, even when they say they're Christians. I'm not sure if that's really um, a good way of saying those things. But divorce is divorce, and the Bible says, no, you can't. So if you think about all this philosophical way of development in the name of humanity, most of them are against the Bible. We're just acknowledging the difference. John chapter 15. So when we disagree with their thoughts, what happens? They may hate you. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. When, when we agree with them, and when we are on the same page with them, they're going to love us. They're going to embrace us and say, hey, you're one of us. The moment we sp speak out about what we believe in, our value set based on the Bible, they will hate us. Especially when you say, Jesus Christ, he's our Lord. You are definitely gonna, going to be persecuted in this world. Just like 2,000 years ago, those people lived in Philippi, did not acknowledge Caesar as Savior and the Lord. Same thing. If we say Jesus is the Lord and Savior, people will not appreciate that. Opponents number two, second group, religious group, or people based on all these things. A lot of people who are practicing religion. Everything other than the Bible and biblical teachings. They're the opponents. Again, we're not fist fighting with them. It's just against each other in terms of their belief system and what we believe in. Do we have to go through the battle? We don't have to volunteer for that. That's not a good idea. We just have to keep our value and keep teaching our value to our friends and family members and go on with our lives. That's all we can do. We're not here to um, become a social activist, right? Jesus did not come to this world as a Messiah to overturn Roman Empire, right? He had a power, but he didn't do that. Same thing. So the second group of opponents can be this. We're just discerning truth versus other. Truth versus false, basically. It says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. This is interesting. This is about Israelites. Think about this. I mean, they, they have zeal for God, but not based on the knowledge of God. If you look at verse 3 and on, it says the righteousness of God. Eventually, the conclusion was Jesus Christ. Israelites did not have that knowledge. They thought they knew who God was. They thought they were doing the right thing as a religious people, but they missed the main point. And Paul bravely spoke about their, his praying for them to be saved. Think about this. Very offensive statement. This is Paul Washer. And <laughs> it's kind of harsh words, but th this is the reality. It's uh, American churches in today's world, right? 
we don't have a lot of churches in America. When you stop right there, what do you mean, Paul? We have so many different churches, and every corner of the street we see church signs. And Paul Washer continues. We have a lot of really nice brick buildings on finely manicured lawns. Yep, we have church buildings with their names. Just because someone says they are of the church or they are Christian doesn't make it so. This is so true. Just because you put out a, a name tag on this building and saying it's an ABC church doesn't make it as church. If there's no gospel message, if there's no Bible-centered service, worship service, that's not church. And just because somebody says, I'm a Christian, I attend church, doesn't make him Christian. That's what he says. He's saying there's so many people and churches out there in this country, America, claiming that they are churches and Christians, but they are not, in fact, churches or Christians. He continued, our missionary activity, our church activity, and everything we do ought to flow from the theologian and the exegete. The man who opens up his Bible and has only one question, what is thy will, O God? What is your will, God? Please let me know so I can preach and teach. I have no other agenda than preaching your word and your intention and your will. And he says, we're not to send out questionnaires or maybe pamphlets and all that to carnal people, non-unbelievers, to discover what kind of church they would attend. Hey guys, you can come to my church and our church, our church offered this entertainment. We have a dinner night or pizza night and you can come and join us. We're not going to talk about Jesus, so just come on over and join us. He said, no, that's not it. Our only goal is based on God's will and what the Bible says. Right? Let's continue. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction for non-believers but of your salvation and that from God. For, because it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. So something has been granted to us for the sake of Christ, right? For the sake of Christ, for his sake. So let me summarize this verse for you. Granted to us for the sake of Christ. Let me go back here. If you look at this one, believe in him and also suffering for his sake. Right? Two different aspects. I'm explaining to you here. Grant to, granted to us for the sake of Christ. The so one area is believing in Christ. As a result of it, we are going to have a hope and joy in Christ. The other aspect of being granted for this grace from God is for the sake of his uh, glory, we're suffering for Christ. When you believe in Christ and promise to uh, possess eternal life, you can have hope and you can rejoice. When you suffer for Christ, for the sake of gospel message, what will be your proper response? You're going to have hope and you're going to rejoice. Same thing, same reaction. You're not going to be disappointed. You're not going to lose hope or get angry. No, we are different as Christians. And from, yeah, from for the explanation of this section, I used 1 Peter. There are two different types of uh, sufferings. So let me show you this. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed <clears throat> because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 
But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. That's one type of suffering. And somehow a lot of people coming to church today think of this as a suffering the Bible is referring to. That's not the case. Please note, that's one type of suffering. And the second type of suffering is this. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. You're suffering as a Christian, but let him glorify God in that name. Just because you're keeping your faith and if you go through some kind of persecution and suffer as a Christian, that's the suffering that Bible is indicating. The first type of suffering is, we're not talking about type A or type B diabetes, right? But it's still here. Suffering type 1, that's based on your wrongdoing. You caused it. It's about you. You misspoke. You were dishonest. You harmed other people, so you suffer as a consequence of your wrong behavior. Bible's focus is about suffering type 2. For the sake of Christ, you are suffering as a Christian. Unfortunately, a lot of us suffer the type 1 suffering in this world, not type 2. You don't have to have suffering, right? Just because you live as a Christian doesn't, doesn't mean you're always in, in suffering and you're always going to be persecuted. But in most cases, when I see people talking about suffering, in most cases, they're referring to type 1. How about you? <clears throat> Please do not confuse these two. Grace and suffering. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. The reason why we have to rejoice. Okay, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. It's tough to go through a difficult time. That's for sure. But we can rejoice because of something else. So that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. At the second coming of Jesus Christ, when we are united with him, that's what we're going to see. Praise, glory, and honor. That's the hope that we have. No matter how successful you are in this world, you will not have true rejoice in your heart. You will not have true peace in your heart. After two, three days of that enjoyment or entertainment you had, you have to look for another enjoyment, right? That desire never um, goes away. <clears throat> this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God, for it has been granted to you, as I explained, that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. The same conflict is the one that Paul had gone through. He believed in Jesus but he has had to suffer for Christ's sake. If you look at YouTube channel and try to look for some moving, motivating speech, look no further. I mean, you can just pick some commencement speech out there. And one of the most famous ones is Steve Jobs his commencement speech back in 2005, it was at Stanford University. And it has different versions of it, but for this one that I have, 
11 million views. If you combine other versions of his speech here, it's way, way over 20 million views. That means at least 20 million, it could be 20 million people, okay. It could be uh, 10 million people watching it twice. I don't know for sure, but there are many people who watched this video, his speech. One of the takeaways that you can um, get from this speech was, you know, just go after your dreams. Uh, love what you do, find something that you love to do, and work hard, and it's going to be rewarded. Now, don't slack off, just do your best, right? As if today is your last day. And there's some other good advices here. Whether you agree with him or not, he was one of those most successful people in human history, in a worldly view. But the question is, how many people out of those people who watch this video, after they are so moved by this motivational speech, actually put them into practice? Just because you follow through his advice doesn't mean you're all going to be Steve Jobs, like a founder of huge companies. But at least there's some truth in there. You are going to be very successful. You are going to be good at what you're doing, right, in most cases, because you love what you're doing. And you spend so many hours and you're dedicating yourselves and become a person of expertise in that field. But how many people actually start doing this and keep on doing this? That's a question to ask. As I mentioned earlier today, so many of us in today's world, Christians, listen to the sermon and Bible studies, and 99% of what they hear, they already know. And they may get a different insights and different way of understanding and deeper understanding, but in terms of practicing what they learn, how many of them are out there actually walking according to the Word of God? That's the question you have to ask. So my conclusion is this. The theme of today's uh, sermon was be worthy of the gospel of Christ. We all know what it means. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul said to Timothy this way, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Paul says it will happen. There's a degree of uh, level of persecution, but you will be persecuted in different ways. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, He's describing what's going to happen in this world. People, bad people, will get worse. They're already bad, but they are going to get worse. That's them. And they will be deceiving and being deceived among themselves. You will witness that. But, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. The so key point is you have to continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. So let me clarify a little more about the meaning of continue in. That's just, it's not a one-time thing. The word meno, uh, that's remain, stay, and reside, that is, um, just stay in one place, right? If you look at all these different meanings uh, that ESB uh, used to describe this word, it's just you are staying, remaining in one place. Let's take a look at this. We have two different type of people in general, right, for, for the sake of this explanation. One is some people are always on the move. Let me give an example about um, computer games, right? 
And some people say, oh, I play game one and you become good at this and then you know a little bit about this game and then you get tired of it. Okay, I want something else. Let me play game two. And you become good at it and you become tired of it and move on to another one. In a worldly sense, we call those people a man of talent, a people. Wow, they, I mean, he or she can play multiple games, different games at a high level. That's pretty good. The second group of people, they continue and remain in the same game. They delve into the game. They become almost professional level. They're really good at that. Of course, they can play some other games for for fun, but they're not as good as that particular game that they're always dedicating themselves. Which one's right? Which one's wrong? We don't want to pass judgment on that. But in a worldly sense, it's good to be talented in many different aspects. No problem. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. You can be good at one thing. That's okay too. But as Christian in spiritual way or the way we live, we got to be delve into the Word of God and stick to the Word of God. Don't try to add or subtract to or from the Word of God. Don't try to add this logic from the world and try to tweak the Word of God. Always look for God's will first. So this is what it meant when I mentioned about this verse earlier. Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. The Word of God that you hear all the time, you feel like there's nothing new. It may sound boring at times. I'm not, I'm not really telling you uh, a false story here. But for me, the Word of God is not boring at all. Oh, because you're a pastor. Well, it's not something new that I uh, you know, go through as a pastor. It was like that before too. That's why I became a pastor, I guess. Is it always exciting? I cannot say, yeah, yeah, it's always exciting. No, but at least it's not boring. But once you get into the, the middle, the heart of the, the Word of God, it touches my heart and soul. Never fails. So I'm here to help you to see what other people see, meaning the people who came and gone before us as Christians who walked with God. And what they saw, what they witnessed, we want to see as well through the Word of God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to worship you. As we learned from the passage, if we try to walk with you and live as Christian, we may face various levels of persecution and difficult times as a Christian. But as Paul has encouraged other people in the Bible, let us always continue in what we learned and firmly believed from your word. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you from now and forevermore. Amen.